Welcome to the Illinois Christian Home Educators Family Conference. I'm so glad you could join us. I'm Kelly Crawford and the title of this session is called When Motherhood Feels Too Hard. And I'm just going to jump right in and get started. So um, I'm from the Deep South in case you couldn't tell from my accent. We live on a big uh, beautiful farm in Alabama and my parents lived there too, just down the driveway. We uh, moved here when I was 12 years old. My dad started a children's ministry for abused and neglected children. And we took some wild wooded land and worked and worked and worked and made it our quiet sanctuary out in the country. And so life is good, but it changed for us drastically. Nine years ago, um, to the, almost to the day, it was Wednesday, April 27th, 2011. That morning my mom and dad called and said that my dad had um, asked her to take him to the ER, to the emergency room, and, which was very uncommon because my father is not the kind of person who goes to the doctor ever. Um, so I knew if something was serious and we couldn't we couldn't get through to the emergency. I, I think we tried calling 911, but we had had a tornado come through that morning and there were a lot of lines down and also roads blocked. So we weren't able to get through to them, so we decided to drive. Um, and I asked her to pick me up. Like I said, I live down just on their driveway down a piece. And I asked her to pick me up and take me with them. Um, and I had a three-week-old baby at the time, so I brought him with me because I was nursing. So by the time we got near the hospital, my dad was doubled over in the seat um, in excruciating pain, begging us to drive faster. He was pale. He started turning gray. It was the most frightening thing that I've been through in my life. Um, we finally get to the ER, have someone come out and get him, and he starts to tell us goodbye. Now this is my dad who has hardly ever been sick his whole life. He's perfectly healthy. He works full, hard days, um, and all of a sudden, just in, in a flash, he was telling us goodbye. And of course, my mom was... Um, not doing well and I remember sinking to the floor in that emergency room and just crying out to God to save his life. Thankfully God did spare him that day. And so I mentioned that that morning we had a round of tornadoes but for days our weather channels have been warning us of a major potentially historic record-breaking tornado event um, predicted for that evening that more tornadoes were coming and once my dad got settled after his procedure we headed home and uh, quickly to be with our children so something felt different about this warning we've had lots of tornado warnings we live in an area where we're used to those but this day felt different and so my husband had felt prompted to prepare more than we normally do and buy batteries for flashlights and, Things like that. Uh, when we got home, I was just so emotionally drained. I didn't really want to do anything but sit and process, you know, and try to get over what had happened. This, the morning was so traumatic for me. But just an hour or so later, we had some neighbors come by, ask if they could come shelter in our basement, which of course we wanted them to do. And uh, a little while later, more neighbors showed up. And before you, we knew it, there were over 35 people, uh, women, men, and children gathered in our house to wait out the weather. So we were kind of just having a party. It was some of our good friends and uh, it was really a fun time, I guess, just to hang out and be together. Well, we had been watching and there were some massive tornadoes that had hit a couple hours away from us. Um, many of you might remember this event because it made national news, but the horrified looks, even on the faces of our meteorologists, I mean, they just stared and sometimes were completely silent because they had never witnessed anything um, of this magnitude. Well, not too long after that, um, one of the ladies there with us told us that it, the weather was getting close to our community. We needed, needed to take shelter. So we gathered everyone. We squeezed everybody in two rooms, two small rooms in our basement that were up against um, the brick wall. And we hadn't been there a full minute before the room pressurized. And I had been close to a tornado before, and I knew what that meant. You know, when your ears, you can feel your ears popping. And, 
and then just a few seconds later this horrific sound of noise and wind and things tearing up and the feeling that everything's going to cave in on you and you're just kind of sitting there realizing it's happening to you you don't ever think it's going to happen to you and you could just feel the house being blown apart on top of this um, the children were all screaming and the men were trying to pray but as the noise got louder they had to pray louder and louder and so it was just this enormous moment it was very intense two of the men were trying to hold the door of the room we were in because the pressure was trying to blow it open and debris was flying up under the um, door so all of that lasted probably no more than 30 seconds and then it was over and we opened the door and even though uh, well we opened the door of the basement and all except where we were was just full of sheetrock and debris. It's as if the house had just kind of caved in and we had to kind of scramble out under that. And so the men went out to survey the damage. As soon as my husband rounded the corner um, and looked up the stairs, he saw a sky that was everything else was gone. And I just remember him coming back down to where we were and he held my shoulders and he said, I need you to really concentrate on how much we have and how incredible it is that we're all still alive he said because I can't even prepare you for what you're about to see this tornado made about a half a mile swath if you can imagine a path of destruction literally half a mile as far as you could see in every direction there was total destruction my parents house was gone we lived on a very heavily wooded farm with thousands of trees I don't think there was a tree left standing. It just looked like broken, just matchsticks as far as you could see. The barns, the shops, every structure flattened. I mean, it was something that's hard to describe unless you were there. We had rescue uh, workers from all over the country in the next few days uh, that told us in all their work they had never seen damage to that extent. It was so bad we all had to put signs up um, at the end of our driveway so people would know where they are. Well, I could spend the rest of the time telling the story, but that's not what my talk is about. I'm getting to that. Thirteen of our neighbors were killed, including one of our dear, dear friends who left his wife and 13 children behind buried under their house. Our men spent the rest of the night digging them out. And while we stayed in that little room for the next I guess three or four hours just waiting to figure out what to do. We just prayed and tried to process and um, began living minute by minute. Uh, emergency vehicles were not able to get into our community because, or to help anybody injured for about five or six hours because the place was so destroyed. You just couldn't get any vehicles in. They weren't even able to land a helicopter. At one point, MedFlight came and had to turn around and go back. Um, it was a bad night. It was a bad night, but I so wish I had time to tell you all the miracles that came from it. The whole story is on my blog if you want to read about it. Just the love and the outpouring of people who came to help and support us is, is enormous, and I can't even begin to describe it. Well, afterward, we stayed with a family um, from our church for about a month. There were 11 of us, and we were blessed to have a man offer his 900 square feet cabin. Um, it's a little bit, when there's 11 of you, it's like that big, but there were two small bedrooms and a half bath, and um, I remember I had a newborn, three-week-old, so it was a difficult time. We were very grateful, very grateful, but at the same time, we were still reeling emotionally from the abrupt trauma that had uprooted us just overnight, and it was just plain hard to be in a tiny cabin with my husband working now 12 to 13 hours a day trying to rebuild our house and figure things out. Besides the emotional toil, just the logistics were taxing. We had to store all of our clothes on a screened in porch and over time they started to mildew from the heat and moisture. The tiny bathroom only had a shower and I had several little ones who weren't old enough to take showers yet so we had to improvise by using uh, large Tupperware tubs out on the patio filled with water. We have pictures that are fun to look at where our little ones were taking baths like that. For some women, the transition may have been easier, but I am a what they call a highly sensitive person. 
and we're just more deeply affected by things, especially our surroundings, and we don't do change easily. And so here I was without even a shred of semblance of my former life, except for my family, which I am eternally grateful. But everything was gone. My home, my childhood home, my comfortable, beautiful surroundings, and trying to make life work in this little tiny space and trying to create some kind of normal for my children. I would find out later that dealing with I was dealing with post-traumatic stress and depression from the grief of such a life-altering event. And I'm sure I was dealing with some postpartum as well. A lot of things going on. It was an overwhelming time. And it finally dawned on me a few months in that motherhood was feeling entirely too hard for me. I felt like I was absolutely drowning emotionally, physically, spiritually. And what do you do? I mean, opting out wasn't much of an option. And I remember one night just sitting down through tears and exasperation and began compiling a book and I called it When Motherhood Feels Too Hard. And that title was just a raw explanation of what I was feeling. And most people who write to thank me for the book don't know it, but this book was for me. And I compiled short devotions, most of which I had already written in the past and some new ones, but words of truth that I needed to tell myself and tether myself to truth. Because when you're up against a wall and you know and you don't know what to do anymore as a Christian, you must keep doing one thing, and that is clinging to what you know is true, regardless of how you feel. And for women, that can be extremely difficult. And that became my lifeline. And what happened through the writing of the book and the process of grief and healing that followed, and it took a long time. I wasn't uh, diagnosed with post-traumatic stress until a year later. But what happened was a certain tough-mindedness and getting my thinking set so that I could face the battle I was in, but also face the next battle of motherhood that would surely come. Because the thing is, you probably won't go through a tornado, and you may go through trials much more difficult than that. But the hardest part of motherhood is really the mundane, the dailiness, the sameness. It's not the tornadoes or any other storms of life. Motherhood can often be overwhelming and just feel too hard in the regular days. Listen to what Os Oswald Chambers said. We do not need the grace of God to withstand crises. Human nature and pride are sufficient for us to face the stress and strain magnificently. But it does require the supernatural grace of God to live 24 hours of every day as a saint, going through drudgery, and living an ordinary, unnoticed, and ignored existence as a disciple of Jesus. It is ingrained in us that we have to do exceptional things for God, but we do not. We have to be exceptional in the ordinary things of life, and holy on the ordinary streets among ordinary people. And that includes our families. So what I learned when I hit this wall through the storm were lessons I would need to carry me through many more days, normal days, that felt too hard because there are many more of those than the days of crises. You know those days. How do we get through them? We take a deep breath and we understand that we are not alone. Your feelings, my feelings, do not make us a bad mother or an inadequate mother. You haven't messed up by having children or choosing motherhood. You know, years ago, mothers lived in a very different culture. It was one that affirmed their position of importance. And that affirmation bolstered their strength for those hard days and hard years when they were in the thick of battling for their homes and the hearts and souls of their children. Mothers, aunts, grandmothers, friends banded together in the unifying belief that mother work was good work. Hard as it is, it was worth every ounce of themselves. But now things are a lot different. Our culture doesn't esteem motherhood and mothers often find themselves feeling alone like an island, that loneliness can become unbearable when the hard days press in. And who can she tell? You know, it's her fault, after all, for having these children or choosing full-time motherhood when she could have chosen something more meaningful in the world's eyes. And that's the message mothers are given. So now we not only have to deal with just the hard places, but we have to often do it alone and silently. But I want to give you some hope. 
motherhood is still of utmost importance and you are not alone. You have been given a sacred calling by your Creator and He sees it all and He knows it all. And what you do is supremely important and for that reason we must win the race believing that He is faithful and He who is faithful has called us to this task. The Lord has been teaching me what to do when motherhood feels too hard and that's what I want to share with you today. But it's going to take some girding up and some rethinking and extra work to get over these new obstacles we face in our day. And this is nothing but the transparency of my heart from one mother to another in the hopes that you will be changed here. There are some real practical things that I believe can lift us up out of the hard places of motherhood and give us incredible power and joy. The starting place is to understand that your feelings of inadequacy don't disqualify you from your job, but in fact, makes you perfect for the job. Have you said to the Lord, why did you give me these children? I'm not good at this. Or why did you give me this child? I don't know what to do with him. I've had one of those. I've had one child alone that taxed every fiber of my being, making me feel like I simply could not do another day. The Lord has reminded me to look into scripture at those people who are giants of the faith to us. Noah, Moses, Abraham, David. We see the battles they won. We see their victories. We see their courage, but we forget how much they were like us. None of them were necessarily cut out for their jobs, for their calling. None of them had superhuman power. In fact, looking closely, we find that they were very much like us. Weak, doubtful at times, they failed, they sinned, and they felt inadequate. Remember Moses, he argued with God that he wasn't the one for the job. But they also had something else. The only thing they needed and the only thing we need, they had a heart after God and a faith that whatever he asked them to do, he would enable them to do it. And this is the power we need to call upon. We need to realize that there's a reason scripture says he calls the weak and broken to do his work. If we were capable of doing this well without him, the whole thing would be pointless because he would not get the glory. And life is all about glorifying him. You are right for the job God has given you. He has called you right where you are and he says, like he said to Moses, I am that I am. We can rejoice in our weakness. So I want to share with you a few things that have changed me as a mother. And I don't mean I went from struggling in the dailiness of motherhood to some sort of plateau above it all where now life is just smooth sailing. I just mean that I'm becoming a little more equipped each day if I renew my mind understand the process of sanctification, I'm seeing a little more clearly what God is doing in all of this. So there are five things that have really changed my approach to motherhood, and I want to share them with you. Number one, I'm learning to fight. Satan, the Bible says, is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Do you think he wants to destroy us and our children and our marriages and our homes? Absolutely. Ladies, we are on the front lines of the most fierce battle in history. And why do you think motherhood is such under attack? If our enemy can defeat mothers, the guardian of home, he has a foothold in the heart of our church. And motherhood is not for the faint of heart. Do we have moments of fainting? Yes, but we must not grow weary in well-doing. He promises that in due season we will reap if we do not faint. We are warrior mothers. Say that out loud. Write it on your walls. Being a Christian makes you a warrior. Being a mother makes you a warrior mother. And as long as we are here, we will be fighting against the enemy of our souls and the enemy of our children's souls. And that should make the mother bear in us come out. Get mad about it if you have to. Look around in our culture. Do you see the battles that rage against us? Do you see how much the job of raising the next generation has been marginalized, even mocked? The world doesn't get it. Giving ourselves to the job of raising men and women is the most worthy thing we will ever do, and it's worth our fight. Jesus has won the victory for our salvation. The fight is over, but the Bible says we still continue to wrestle against the darkness of the world until the end. And in that thinking, we gird ourselves up. If we fall, we get back up. 
when we know who our enemy is, we know what strategies to implement. And when we understand who we are, and more importantly, whose we are, we can say in the heat of it, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. If you don't believe in the moment, say it anyway. Speak the truth with your mouth. Verbalizing scripture is one of the most powerful weapons against the enemy. When you are in those weary moments, speak the truth of God's word. Whether you feel it or not, speak it just like Jesus did when he was tempted in the wilderness in his weariness. The second thing I'm learning, I'm learning to die. The theme of dying to self is the heart of the New Testament. Christ died that we may live. But ironically, those who lose their lives will save them. You know what scripture says. It's the great paradox of the Christian life. But don't we struggle to keep that perspective? Nothing calls us harder to death. Than motherhood. The very act of carrying and sustaining another human life begins the motherhood journey with my life for yours. And for the rest of your life, you will be giving, dying, and sacrificing for another person. We need to remember what kinds of things Jesus esteemed when he was here. Do you know the kinds of things he said were important? Giving drinks of cold water, that person will not lose his reward. Washing feet, the grand finale of Jesus' life on earth, and feeding hungry people. So when you're tempted to feel unnoticed or feel like you aren't doing the important things or even start to begrudge the sacrifices, I want you to stop and remember whose you are and what he says is important. And know that he sees your work and he is making note of it. And it will come up again when you stand before him. Dying to the world means dying to man's approval. And this, I think, has been the greatest snare of women and their distaste for home. You want to know something ra that radically challenged how I think about my job? For a while, I got caught up in wallowing. I dwelt on my shortcomings, the noise, the messes, how busy I am in a day. And I almost allowed myself to start thinking like a victim, having my little pity party. I couldn't wait for my husband to get home so I could tell him all about how hard my day was. And you don't know what I go through. And I wish you understood. Have you done that? Have you felt like you just wanted everyone to know how hard you work? How many diapers you changed? What kind of catastrophes you endured? And that's why they created Facebook, by the way. Rachel Jankovic sent me her new book called Fit to Burst. And she said something profound. And I think every mother needs to get this. She explained that we become that person I just described when we feel like everyone is, is taking from us all the time. And don't you feel that pulling on you and asking and taking? And So she pointed out how Jesus gave more than we ever could, he, but he gave. And don't miss that word. No one took anything from him. And no one can take anything from us if we are giving it. And when we are giving ourselves and not being taken from, that changes everything. And I can freely give to my children because Jesus gave to me. I can consider it a privilege to give to my family because the King of Kings sees it. He marks it and delights in a cheerful giver. Are they taking from you or are you giving it cheerfully? The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. Have you ever thought about that in the context of giving of yourself? We think about that in ter terms of tithing or being charitable, but what about giving of ourselves to our families, your life, your labor, your love? What a glorious thought that we share in the suffering and blessings of Christ when we give. Now to pour out freely means we must be filled ourselves. He pours in, we pour out. I can't stress enough how important it is to keep yourself filled with truth, with him, with scripture, a devotion, an encouraging sermon, let him continually pour in so that you're able to give. The third thing I'm learning is to be grateful. I'm learning how profoundly important gratitude is in our lives. Every person in every circumstance, no matter how good or bad, has the choice to choose gratitude or to choose to dwell on what is wrong or what they don't have. And I've witnessed not only in my own life, but Watching other people, this is the one thing that can make the difference in whether you're able to overcome obstacles in life or whether they destroy you. A lack of gratitude can literally destroy your life. At the very least, it can rob you of the joy God intended you to have 
And I recommend a book called um, Choosing Gratitude by Nancy Lee DeMoss. We'll remove now. And begin to build a habit of finding what you can rejoice about each day. The fourth thing I'm learning is I'm learning to see. Don't we get in, in, an, in an instant world? We live in an instant world where it's so easy to lose focus of waiting. The technology has done much to make our lives better, and I'm not complaining about that. But we've had some serious trade-offs because of having everything so instantly given to us. We can become conditioned to be discouraged if we have to wait for any delayed gratification. And delayed gratification, which is a vision beyond the now, is something we must learn when it comes to our job as mothers. If you don't learn to see over the pile of laundry, around the mountain of dishes, and through the eyes of that little person that just dropped a roll of toilet paper in the toilet, you're in trouble at best. Vision, the ability to see the end, to see why we're investing so much, why we're willing to die and give ourselves to this task that can seem so meaningless at times, it's the vision that makes all the difference in your life. Do not let yourself be short-sighted. Vision looks into a four-year-old's eyes and sees a man and gives you the stamina for the rest of the day to keep teaching him the importance of self-control instead of just wanting him to stop it now so you can have some peace. Vision lets you stop in the middle of what I call the witching hour, you know, around five o'clock. You're preparing dinner and everyone's falling apart at once. It lets you close your eyes for even a minute and know that tomorrow, this moment that feels like a crisis, will be a vague memory. Vision lets you parent through the moment, demonstrating to your children what it means to persevere, to run with patience, and to nurture hearts even when it's hard. Vision does not let me despair. It keeps me in perspective. It helps me remember that though some days are long, my time with these little people is really very short. I have a powerful job. I've got two who just left the house or have left the house already and not so recently, but it just takes my breath away how short my time parenting them really was. I am the maker of nations. You are the nurturer of souls, the shepherd of hearts, and the one who can point an entire generation to Christ. That's what you do every day. And ladies, we do that in the small moments of the day. That's when our great work is done. And that brings me to my next point, my fifth point. Don't despise the small things. Perhaps it's how the feminist movement gained such momentum by reminding mothers that they weren't doing anything important. Because how else could they have convinced mothers to turn their job of nurturing and caring for their own children over to someone else? They became deceived. A seed dropped in the ground disappears as soon as the dirt covers it. In fact, only the one who planted it knows it's there. And he could walk away. After all, it's just it just looks like dirt. No one would think anything of it. But we know the truth that the seed is there deep down. It needs water. Pretty soon it will need constant attention of pulling weeds and tending. And no one likes to pull weeds. It's hot and it's not fun. It'd be easier to get somebody else to do it. But the faithful gardener knows what's coming and he'll do the hard work it takes to reap a bountiful harvest. The one who said it's not worth it will end up with dead or fruitless plants. And motherhood is so much like a garden. It's my favorite analogy. You can't just pull weeds once. It's a constant effort of faithfulness. But the harvest is coming. That's why we need vision. And the thing is, we need to remind ourselves of this so we aren't taken by surprise at the work of motherhood. We just need to get it into our bones and know that it's hard. Mother work, motherhood work is hard, but it's good so we can roll up our sleeves and get busy. It's in those small moments of the day where our greatest work is done. If you fret because you don't get to take big vacations or do special things with your children a lot or you're always worried about wanting to create big events thinking that those are the important things of life, don't. Don't fret that. Those are extras. The real trying of tying of heartstrings and making of memories happens right there in the ordinary days. And how do we remind ourselves? I'm talking about practical strategies to keep your mind renewed. We actively seek to be reminded. In the book that I mentioned, the devotional that I wrote, um, in the back of that book are nine survival tips. 
And the first one is that when you find yourself in survival mode, it's relationships first. Cancel anything extra that uses up your energy and time. Perhaps even things you feel like you need to be doing. You aren't obligated to anything else that distracts you or takes you from your job as a mother and wife. And there will be seasons, so learn to give yourself grace, take the pressure off, and nurture your children. Do what you need to do to get out of survival mode. And let me tell you something very important. When we see our children as God sees them, we become parents of soldiers, fully expecting our children to carry the despised cross of Christ into a God-hating culture. What is the purpose of children? Why, why did he give us children? What is our purpose? We are here on business, our father's business, and understanding the importance of children in that work changes us. It changes our vision. Jesus poured himself out for a few people every day so that they could carry the message of the gospel to the next generation. Can we do any less? I want to read uh, an excerpt of a post I wrote about the purpose of children because I think it's so fitting for this talk. It goes like this, how does God view children? The same way he views you. I knew you before I formed you. I had a plan for you before you even existed. What is the purpose of children? The same purpose you and I have, to proclaim the glory of the one who created us. Is there anything more humbling, more powerful, than what the Lord has given us to do as mothers? Do you want to buy into the second-rate business of average Christianity, or do you want to invest in the eternal? See all you have and buy the field of treasure. Sell, I'm sorry, sell all you have and buy the field of treasure, leaving a legacy in your home that will fly in the face of a God-hating world and stand in stark contrast, answering the brokenness that has been left in the wake of a church who has lost sight of her purpose here. When motherhood feels too hard, and it will, you need to stop. You need to fight the battle in your mind first. And on a practical note, let me just throw out some help to you. You might need to gather up the kids and go outside in the yard and breathe and just get a fresh perspective. You need to look deep into the eyes of your children. See past today. Remember the chaos only lasts for a season, maybe only a few days, maybe only a few hours. Don't let yourself forget that you won't live in the chaos forever. Just get through it. You'll get to the other side. You might need to drop everything and focus on discipline for a season. If you aren't enjoying your children because of disobedience, it's your job to get a handle on that and work on building relationships, establishing a healthy authority, and when you do that, things will go so much better. If you find yourself um, losing your temper often, you might not be disciplining, disciplining enough. So consider that. You might need to hire someone to help you get caught up with laundry until you get your bearings. You might need to adopt a more realistic expectation about house cleaning. You know, the Bible says where there is no oxen, the stable is clean. And I know for me, I've struggled with this. Clutter bothers me and it robs me of my peace, but we do have a house full of children. So I compromise. I let go of some of my expectations and then I work on teaching them to help me keep order, kind of delegating. So it's, it's a balancing act, but we have to remember that in this season, our houses are going to be lived in and keep baskets lying around, throw the clutter in the baskets, keep them contained, find compromise in that. You might need to let go of some other OCD things you have. Um, a friend of mine, when her children were little, she literally could not go anywhere after 4 p.m. because she had this nightly routine that she felt she couldn't interrupt. And I'm all for routines. Understand that. But when you have to decline uh, important events to keep your routines because the baby might miss his bath or whatever, you might need to reevaluate what's important and let go of some of that. You might need to sit down and just look at your schedule and see if there are things you could free up, some time and energy that aren't necessary. You might need to make your crock pot your best friend, simplify meals, use paper plates, buy some loaf bread instead of feeling the pressure to always make it, if that's your thing. Um, I read something somewhere, a lady, lady was asked, what would you have done differently if you could go back and do anything differently? Her children were grown. She said, I would have bought my bread and spent more time playing. 
And sometimes life just feels too hard if we aren't healthy, especially if your uh, feelings of being overwhelmed last for a long time. Maybe you need to do an overhaul on your health. There are easy things you can do. Uh, make sure you're getting enough vitamin D, getting in the sun, taking short walks, taking a good multivitamin, um, just some moderate exercise. If you're prone to stress, all of these things can go a long way in making a difference. And finally, you need to rush the doors of heaven. Don't forget the privilege we have to approach the throne of grace and remind your Heavenly Father of His promises. And the one I leave with you today, my favorite, is faithful is He who called you, who also will do it. You'll get through this even when motherhood feels too hard. And the Lord is with you, and He gives you strength and power, and all glory be to Him. Thanks so much for listening.